Thank you for the opportunity to welcome Carolina Catholic Radio to the Carolinas and to give a little bit of a story here of us at Belmont Abbey because Belmont is to some extent the seedbed of the growth of the Catholic Church in the Western Carolinas. It goes back to the 19th century in 1876 when the monks were given the property that's now Belmont Abbey by Father Jeremiah O'Connell. Father O'Connell and his brother Lawrence O'Connell were at the time living at St. Peter's Church in Charlotte, present site, earlier building, and Father Jeremiah would ride circuit to visit the few and scattered Catholics in the Western Carolinas. One of his stops was St. Joseph's Church, north of here in Mount Holly, which is probably the oldest standing Catholic church in North Carolina in its original form, built in the 1840s by Irish gold miners. While he was staying there on one of his circuit stops, this property came up for sale at a bankruptcy auction during Reconstruction, and Father Jeremiah, who had started a school in Columbia, South Carolina, which didn't survive, had the idea of a religious community and a literary institution, as he put it, to serve as a focal point for the scattered Catholics in the Western Carolinas. He bought the property at bankruptcy auction and eventually convinced the Benedictines at St. Vincent Arch Abbey in Latrobe, Pennsylvania to come down here south and start a school and a monastery. In doing so, the monks there were stepping out of their normal, normal procedure. They had come to minister to German immigrant Catholics in the United States. In North Carolina in the 1870s, there were about a total of 800 Catholics, most of them on the eastern seaboard, and very few, if any, were German. And yet, for reasons we are not sure, they took this challenge, and on April 21st in 1876, Father Hermann Wolf arrived from the German Catholic parish in Richmond, Virginia, with two students, and the Abbey and what's now Belmont Abbey College began on that day. The work of the Benedictines here has been primarily in pastoral care for Catholics and in education in the southeast. In addition to Belmont, the monks here have founded four other monasteries in the southeast, each one of which has a school. But here in North Carolina, unique in American Catholic history, uh, the Abbey has a, a special place. There was no organized Catholic diocese in North Carolina in the 1870s. There were simply too few Catholics and too few clergy. However, with the independence of the Abbey and its establishment in the 1850s, 1880s, excuse me, the Holy See saw its problem of having a resident Catholic bishop solved, and the first abbot of Belmont Abbey, Leo Hade, became the vicar apostolic, that is, the bishop of a mission territory, vicar apostolic of North Carolina. Then in 1910, nine counties were segregated out of the Vicariate of North Carolina and became what is called a territorial abbey, where the subsequent abbots down to 1977 served as the, the local ordinary, took the place of the bishop for that territory. Now that there are two flourishing dioceses in North Carolina, we no longer are involved in the pastoral care and parish work, which is not kind of what monks generally do. We did that because of the need, but we've been instructed since then to focus on the witness of our monastic life and Catholic education. And let me talk about those two, uh, monastic life and Catholic education. To some extent, monastic life is evangelical. That is, it, it preaches the gospel simply by its existence. The monastery serves as a sign to our neighbors, to anyone who sees us, of the importance and the primacy in human life of seeking God. Because St. Benedict's rule doesn't have any specific work assigned or a specific task assigned to his monks other than to seek God by praying, living, and working in the same community for a lifetime. It is that praying, living, and working together for the purpose of growing closer to God, which is a sign and a reminder to the larger church and the larger world community that that is the goal of every human life because we were created, as the Catechism said, to know, love, and serve God in this world and to be happy with Him in heaven. That's what the goal of human life ultimately is. 
and by our, our witness to that, and particularly by our prayer. Because in a, a culture which, which prizes highly pragmatism and activity, prayer doesn't produce anything. Rather, it opens the prayer for God to produce something in him or in her, and to intercede continually to God for his blessings on ourselves, on our neighbors, on our college community, on our diocese, and on the world. So in that sense, monastic life by its existence has a unique treasure to offer to the larger community of the church. In our table reading recently, we're reading a book that's co-authored by Bishop Robert Barron, the Auxiliary Bishop of Los Angeles, who's quite well known as a Catholic evangelist. And he was speaking of a meeting at which question was raised, what value is pacifism in the church and pacifist? And the response was, the church needs pacifists like it needs celibates. That is, not everybody is a pacifist. You don't want, for example, Bishop Barron said, the president to be a pacifist because he's sworn to protect and defend. You don't want all Catholics to be celibates. But the witness of those two, pacifists, celibates, and the church, is a witness in a special way to the God of peace and to the God of love. So monastic life, in a special way, the church needs its monks and its contemplatives. Not everybody is called to that life. But to have the monks in the church as reminding people of the primacy of seeking God, the primacy of the peace that comes from God, and the importance of prayer in any person's life is a valuable contribution. But that monastic life at, here at Belmont Abbey has also flowed out, as I mentioned from the beginning, in the students who have come here. And it's in a unique way by sending those students back out into the world from their education that we can have an impact on the larger church and on the larger culture. Because Benedictine education, in our minds, has been first and foremost of all concentrated on the formation of the person. So education is not simply the, the acquiring of skills and facts and understanding, but rather it's the acquiring of a character which allows one to seek what is truly good. And so this education in the Catholic intellectual tradition is focused on the primacy of truth, that there is truth to be known, and human beings are in fact especially sort of made to desire that truth. And what's true is good and lasting and desirable and beautiful. So those aspects that come in the Catholic intellectual tradition closely allied with the liberal arts tradition are to challenge our students to think about what is truly important, what is truly lasting, and what are the true goods that are in and of themselves good and are those goals we ought to pursue. At the same time, it's important to prepare students to go out for their profession or career, because that use of their own talents, their own abilities, the things they do well, is part of the actualization of God's gifts to them, which will allow them to fulfill their goals, their vocations in life, and to contribute by being not only highly skilled professionals, but highly ethical and moral professionals to the benefit of the entire community. So that's been our work here at Belmont Abbey for 145 years now. And together with the Sisters of Mercy, our sister community down the street, have been in particular interested in education and in founding a stable Catholic community, which as I said, has now come to fruition in two flourishing and active dioceses in North Carolina. So our, our principal outreach after the witness of our monastic life now is Belmont Abbey College. And in the conditions of the contemporary culture, the relativism, the materialism, the consumerism, it seems to me that Catholic colleges today are more important than ever in a desire for diversity, where oftentimes religious faith commitment is the one diversity that's not desired. A Catholic college brings to the mix of higher education a particular and centuries-old tradition of education that could indeed provide 
a very valuable contribution to that desire for diversity in education, because we have a specific approach, as I've outlined, on what it means to be an educated person. But that education is not simply for success in this world, but rather for success in this world, which is a good human life, which is simply the foundation for success and eternal life. So it's our, our conviction that Catholic higher education has not only a role to play, but an essential role to play in the evangelizing role of the church in sending out well-educated men and women, well-educated in the sense not only a professionally skilled, but committed to the truth and committed to the good to, to impact our culture and to combat the, the emptiness and the untruthfulness alive in the, in the culture today. It's also the motto of the Benedictines is peace, pax. That peace is something that we pray each, each day in, in the Eucharistic liturgy when we recall that Jesus said to his disciples, peace I leave you, my peace I give you, a peace that the world cannot give. That life focused on seeking God, the conviction that ultimately God is in control over all, the peace that comes from opening space in one's life to be filled with grace, which is the very life of God, is the only sure way to find peace in the world. And in the, the craziness of the world turned upside down and the coronavirus pandemic, and the, the harshness and the divisiveness of the social problems and the election campaign, it's important to have these oases of peace because too often we can be sucked into the, the frenzy of passing things in such a way that we forget the abiding importance of etern eternal things. So the monastery provides a space, the abbey provides a space into which we invite people to come and step aside for a moment to be refreshed by God's love. To remember Jesus' words, come to me all you who labor and are heavily burdened and I will give you rest. Because ultimately, amid the changes of this world, the challenges of this world, the hurts of this world, Jesus is the only one who will give us rest and can share with us that peace which the world cannot give. So I hope if you're here in Belmont, in the vicinity of Charlotte, that you stop by to this, one of the foundation places of the Catholic Church and its growth in Western North Carolina. Enjoy the, the peace of the campus and join us in our prayer as we ask God to, to enlarge our hearts, to open the space of our hearts, as St. Benedict puts it, so that it can be filled with God's love and peace, which we then can share with others in the world today. Thank you for the opportunity of being with you today, and God bless the good work of evangelization of Carolina Catholic Radio.